This morning, uh, there is only one story that around the world is going to be told. Did you know there are going to be 2.4 billion, with a B, that's even more than McDonald's will sell hamburgers today. That's how many of us are going to gather to hear God's word. So now, hear the very story as told from the first gospel writer, the earliest of the gospels, the gospel according to Mark as he tells what happened on that very first Easter morning. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him, meaning Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb they had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, had, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. They were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. What an incredible story, this story, the greatest story ever told, coming on this very day. Jeff Maberto, one of the guys that works back in our sound booth, showed me this week earlier uh, this picture. It's a guy who decided that he was going to take all the chocolates out of the wrappers and replace them with grapes. You know why? April Fools, right? Who could have imagined? What, what a crazy event that April Fools uh, uh, that Easter falls on April Fool's. It hasn't happened, Jonathan, since 1956, long before you were born. That was the last time that April Fool's and Easter were the same. Now, before that, it had happened in 1945 and 1934, but for, this is the, the first time since 56 that April Fool's and Easter fell on the same day. I remember that in, in the very first church I served, uh, that year that Debbie and I went to that congregation, uh, April Fool's Day was also a Sunday. It wasn't Easter. But we decided to do a really silly and fun service. And so the service began with the benediction and ended with the call to worship. You know, everything was turned around. And there was a really funny, uh, she was just silly, you know, she was the life of the party kind of person, a young red-headed gal that was bubbly, Sherry was her name, and I said, uh, Sherry, we're going we're gonna to do this, you're going to wear the robe at the first half of the service, and then we're going to change in the middle when there were some other fun things happening in the music, and it was amazing. And then I realized that was the only Sunday that my father-in-law ever saw me lead worship. <laughs> and I, all I could think was, my goodness, he must have prayed hard. His poor daughter married to such an idiot. I, oh my goodness. Easter is uh, today an, an April Fool's kind of thing. But Easter is also the day, as, as this text said, that they went, the women went, not expecting to find uh, a resurrection had occurred. They, they went to do what the women in that culture did. They went to do like funeral directors do today. They went to embalm the body, to, to put pour on the body spices and other things. And it, it's really interesting, but before they, they're on the way before they realize, oh my gosh, 
Who's going to move the stone? You know, they're already there. They've got, the, they've got the spices. And about just before they get there, they say, oh, my gosh, what are we going to do? Only to discover when they got there that the stone was rolled away. And it was Jesus. Now, not everybody knows that the same Jesus who was crucified is the risen Lord. Watch and see. Hey. Thanks for helping me get this ready. My kids love Easter. <laughs> Who doesn't love Easter, am I right? Yeah, that's true. But if you think about it, leading up to that first Easter, Jesus had it pretty rough. Wow, I never really thought of that. <laughs> I wonder whatever happened to that guy. Well, you know, he, he died on the cross. Yeah. You sure about that? Yeah. No, no, that's a different guy. I'm thinking of the Jesus that, uh, what's his last name? No, 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 no. It's the same guy. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yep. I just never connected the two together before. Jesus on a cross. I wonder whatever happened to that guy. Uh, he, uh, he came back to life. Three days later. What? Yeah. Wait, we're still talking about tomb Jesus. Yeah. That's the same guy? Yeah. yeah, he died on the cross for our sins. No, no, that's a different Jesus. No, 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 same one. Died on the cross, was buried in the tomb, came back to life, and now he sits at the right hand of God. Wait, cross Jesus is the same as right hand of God Jesus? Yeah. Not separate Jesuses? There's no separate Jesuses. I just never put them all together before. No, it's still it's still one guy. Wait, you understand what this means, don't you? One guy did all of that? I mean, that changes history, that changes everything. That is big. He deserves more than just jelly beans for his birthday. Wait, so the Easter Bunny is the no. same? Well, you can't make this stuff up, can you? But there really are people who, who do have his questions. You mean this Jesus guy that, that was on the cross is the same one who was raised? People don't believe it. Easter is really God's power to bring life out of death. That is the hope that we celebrate. That is the reality that we affirm that to all of the deaths and pain we experience, there is hope beyond this life. That all those loved ones whom, over whom we have stood at the casket and watched them and prayed for them and prayed for ourselves, that that's not the end. That's our hope. That's why you come today to really ask yourself, is it true? Is it really true? Did it really happen? And for 2,000 years, people all around the world, all colors, all nations, all beliefs, all political systems, all of them together say, yes, it is true. Easter is God's hope for us. God's hope for us. But before Easter is about life, it's really about death. Well, I'm rounding third and heading for home on my career, and, and as one inevitably does, and those of you who have retired, I'm sure you know that you did the same thing, and so I've kind of been thinking about how my life has been and how God has touched me, and as I thought about the fact that before Easter's about life, it's about death, I, I suddenly began to remember so many experiences of death that as a pastor and for 20 years as a volunteer police chaplain, I experienced. And as I thought about that, I remembered that within two years, I buried, I buried two of my first cousins, both of whom had been killed on motorcycles. One when he was 29 and the other was almost 50, both leaving family and children, one grandchildren. And I... Oh, my goodness, death is no respecter of persons. All of us, every family experiences that. 
And then I thought about another death experience I had, had, had been a chaplain to when I was working with Marion County Sheriff's Department. Uh, I had been summoned to uh, I-65 on the south side of Indy between the Greenwood and Southport exit, those of you who know, know that part of the road. And I'd been summoned there on a Tuesday evening about 5.30 because there had been a wreck there. Uh, a woman had driven off the road, a young woman, 28 years old, driven off the road, went down into the, that point. There was kind of a, a dip in the median, and she had kind of gotten crossways in that. And it, somehow she was going way too fast. Her car flipped over, and she died. It was my job as the police chaplain then to go and make the death notification. That's what we cop chaplains do. And so I drove back to the northeast side. Her home was about 30th and Post Road in the neighborhood right there. And I, uh, uh, all I knew was that the next of kin, she had a husband. So I met him. He came to the door. He had a very heavy uh, German-English accent and... I had to tell him the horrible news that his wife had been killed in a car wreck. And I also had to tell him the police had determined it was because of her cell phone use. We all talk about that. And we all use our phones. But I guess those of us who have those kind of experiences know that it really can be deadly. And as we began to talk, I, I had more and more empathy for this young guy who was, I don't even think he was 30 yet. He had, uh, they had met, she was an exchange student, she'd gone to Germany to study. They'd met and fell in love and, and uh, for a couple of years they'd kind of gone back and forth. He would come and visit her and she would go to Germany and visit him. And finally they said they couldn't live without each other and so they married and then uh, they spent their first year of married life in Germany and uh, near Nuremberg. And then he said, well, I'd really like to experiment and try your country. And she said, wonderful. I'd love to come back and be near my family. Her family was here in Indy. So, so they uh, made arrangements, finally got the visa approved and everything because they'd been married. And so they came and he had been a firefighter over there. And as tough as it is to get a firefighter job here, it's even more difficult to do it in Germany. And he had had his job less than a year and he had to resign it, come to Indy, he was hopeful soon that he was going to get on at uh, Warren Township Fire Department. That's been, it was, this was like 97 or 98. And so uh, he had just received word that he was going to be hired in a few weeks. At the same time he receives word that his beloved wife has been killed in a car wreck because of using the cell phone as she drive, drove. I've, you know, probably you're like me. There, there are a lot of uh, stories you don't know the end to. You, you, you know people that you had uh, touch with or connected with for a certain time, and then somehow either you lead them or they lead you, or you, you drift apart and you no longer have them in your life. And I've often wondered, whatever happened to that young German firefighter? I've, I've wondered... Did, did he go back to Germany because all his family was there? Did he stay here and meet another American and marry? Did he stay on the fire? I, I don't know any of that. But what I know is that before Easter is about life, it's really about death. The U.S. Census uh, information, the, reason, the most recent, as of uh, January 1st of this year, the projected a population of our country is 326,971,000 and on January 1st, 407. And the last date for which we have uh, reliable death information from the end of 2015, there were 2,713,000 uh, Americans who died in that year. And it was the first time in many years that the life expectancy for U.S. people went down. It dropped by a tenth of a point. They think it's because of the opioid and drug uh, uh, overdoses that has claimed the life, and 
If you're an obit reader like me, every week you'll see some young person's name in there. This week I saw two 18-year-olds, and I always wonder, well, I wonder if that was because of, of drug overdose. We don't know. They don't put that in there, obviously. We don't know. But what we know is that death is very real and that it's very much a part of the lives of every family. There are all kinds of causes of death. Today we know the top three. The first most is heart uh, events. That claims the most number of people. Cancer is second. And respiratory distress or respiratory problems is the third leading cause of death. And then four, five, and six. I was surprised that accidents was the fourth leading cause of death, followed by strokes. And Alzheimer's keeps creeping up, and now it's the sixth leading cause of death. We all know that death is a part of life. That great playwright George Bernard Shaw said it this way, Life's ultimate statistic is the same for all. One out of one dies. We're all going to die. We know that's a part of life. But we gather here not to hear me talk about death. We gather here to remember that God is a God of life. That God can bring life out of death. God can bring hope out of despair. God can bring peace out of the pain and turmoil of life. This year, uh, Easter for my family is, is no academic subject. My beloved Deb, her mother died just before Christmas. And uh, it, was a, it was a peaceful death on December 8th. But it soon became very unpeaceful when we were doing the visitation, and most of you don't know this story, but we were doing the visitation, and some of you actually came at the time, the same time the cemetery man came and got Debbie and me and said, we need to talk. That's not good. And so he took us to a private place and said, we were digging to Deb, and me said to Deb, we were digging your mother's grave, and we found somebody else in her grave. You can't make this stuff up. It really happened. And so we pushed further and we found out that 33 years ago when Debbie's father died, they had placed him in the wrong grave. Now this is also the same cemetery where the owners absconded with 25 million 10 years ago on the south side. And so it shouldn't, I guess it shouldn't have been a surprise, but it was. It, I've done almost 500 funerals. I'd never had an experience like that. And here it's happening in our family. So, you know, it can happen to anybody. And what we then had to deal with is, okay, the, this was a Wednesday night, the funeral was Thursday morning, what are we going to do? So we temporarily placed mom in a mausoleum. Then we had to contact the other family and say, would you move your loved one who's been buried for 25 years in the grave? It, well, it, it really was uh, quite, a, quite an ordeal, and it caused us to say yes, Death is very real and death is very painful. But some six weeks later, after doing all the state's paperwork, we disinterred mom. The other lady was moved over one grave and then we could put mom and dad back together. And there was a great sense of finality and peace for our family. And we had a great celebration that day when we finally, I think we really did celebrate on the day we went back and and actually were able to bury mom and we all laid our hands on the casket and prayed God's blessings on her and on us. And I think finally we began to celebrate. Life brings death, but in the midst of death, there is God's hope. In the midst of your struggles and suffering, God will never leave you. I love our founder, John Wesley. When he was facing his own death, he said this, and it became the watchword of the Methodist movement. From 1791 till 2018, this one statement has propelled many Methodist people. Here's what Wesley said. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be interesting? He thought about what he wanted his last words to be. And 20 people were at his bedside when he died. And 20 people confirmed these were John Wesley, the founder of Methodism's last words. Eight little words. The best of all is, 
God is with us. The best of all is God is with us. So you need not fear, though your loved ones perish. You need not fear, just like the women who came to the tomb expecting death to be overcome, or expecting death not to be overcome, only to discover he is not here. He has risen. Rita Snowden, a wonderful poem, poet, said it this way, Hang out your hallelujahs. The tomb is open. The Roman guard gone. Death defeated. The Holy One of life walks again. Comforting the troubled, healing the sick, forgiving the sinners, and spreading his gospel through the lips and lives of those made new in him. Hang out your hallelujahs. And all of God's people together say, Amen.